And, and now can I welcome on stage Reverend Andrew Ashton. Well, thank you very much indeed for the invitation to speak this evening. What makes a priest join an event like this? It's not very conventional to do so. Can any of us who grow up in, who live in, or who experience different global contexts and who witness the violent consequences of political and economic exploitation remain silent? Whether our conscience is a moral one or a political one, or rooted in faith, as in my case, as a follower of one who stood for justice, the breaking down of barriers, the speaking of truth, and the promotion of life and peace for all, we are all compelled, compelled to ask questions in the face of political, economic, military, and religious policies, actions, and alliances that create division, conflict, and often catastrophic suffering for so many, whilst benefiting so few, who are very far from the mess that we create. As a child brought up in the midst of a civil war in what was then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, I grew up witnessing the pain caused by conflict, and even as a child was vaguely aware of the complexity of that and also of the humanity existing within individuals on all sides. And that is a dilemma which, with, I, with which I continue to struggle. But experiences have not just been about conflict, and the world isn't just about conflict either. I've witnessed the destruction of the rainforest, that 90% of the rainforest in West Africa, to accommodate the cocoa plantations to support the West demand for chocolate. Similar deforestation, 90% approaching now in Sumatra, to support vast palm oil palm plantations. And I read last week a devastating fact, I didn't know, that most of the world's toilet paper comes from the rainforest in Indonesia, most of which has been obliterated. Horrifying fact, that. I've visited the slaughter chambers of Rwanda in an ethnic genocide that has its roots in colonial divide and rule policies, and seen the idle cotton looms of Sri Lanka whose high quality cotton was unsellable when I saw them because of the high tariffs imposed on export so as not to be able to compete with cheap American imports. These are but of course a fraction of thousands, many thousands of stories of harsh economic, environmental, political realities that are intricately connected with global institution, it's institutional greed and self-interest. Not to mention, of course, that the myriad of conflicts fueled and prolonged by the arms industry or the thirst for control of oil wealth, which brings vast economic dividends for governments and corporations, but which care not for the death and maiming of millions and the destruction of nations. Do our governments care two hoots about human rights, really? What is it all about? At best, our governments collude with these actions, and at worst, and too often, we create them. Is the West solely to blame? Of course not. Local factors, local players play a role that should not be understated in adding layers of complexity to already multi-layered contexts. But so many of these contexts have, on all continents have been molded, manipulated, and created by Western economic and political interests over the last century that have played a crucial role in nurturing corruption, economic disparity, and conflict in multiple societies. We lament the humanitarian catastrophe of refugee flows to Europe, but will we ever address how our political and economic rape of Africa or our disastrous strategic interventions in Asia and the Middle East over the past decades have contributed to that massive flow of refugees? Instead of just blaming those countries alone for poverty, corruption and wars that we have helped to create. How long do citizens, journalists, politicians, religious leaders, academics, teachers simply accept the status quo because this is the way it is, or as I've heard too often, it's too complicated, or because of our own economic and political interests? For over 30 years, I've been a regular visitor to Israel-Palestine and have seen the entrenchments of what even South African visitors to the West Bank, who lived through the worst years of apartheid, 
and I visited South Africa during that time too, have declared to be even worse than apartheid. And of course, I spent time in Gaza as well. The walling off of the West Bank, the theft of prime land and resources, the destruction of homes, the cantonization of the people, the brutality of violence against um, those who dare to protest, and of course, the killing and imprisonment of children. And all, these, all the while, these injustices are viewed with no more than a stated concern by our governments. It seems to me that our only sense of justice is when it serves our own political and economic interests, never mind the millions of who suffer the consequences of our ensuring that those interests prevail. As a regular visitor to Syria prior to the conflict, and having visited the country 10 times, often independently, since 2014, I have been shocked and appalled at the terrible misrepresentation of the realities on the ground in Syria by the media and by politicians. This misrepresentation stems in part from a refusal to step outside one narrative, a narrative created by highly questionable and biased sources, either almost exclusively embedded with sympathetic and sympathetic to militant jihadists in areas of the, areas of the country they control, or sitting in offices in London, Geneva, or Istanbul, and accepted uncritically without verifiable evidence, while simultaneously refusing to listen to or accept the voices of the 80% of the population of Syria who live inside government-controlled areas of the country, and the vast majority of internally displaced who have fled to the government-controlled areas of the country from the so-called militant rebel-controlled areas. In December 2016, I was present with Vanessa Bili in Aleppo during the liberation of the east of the city and entered areas of the city, including the old city, just hours after their liberation. We also met with some of the tens of thousands of internally displaced who emerged from the horror of East Aleppo and who chose to flee not with the jihadists to Idlib, but to the safety of Lest Aleppo, where we witnessed them being given food, immediate medical attention and shelter by the Syrian and Russian army and the Syrian Arab Red Crescent and others. The stories of the brutality that they had suffered under the Al-Qaeda-linked terrorists whose fate the Western media were lamenting for months on end, who executed those who opposed them, who withheld food and medical assistance, who gang-raped women, who stole property, tortured and killed suspected government sympathizers, are beyond horrific and too numerous to mention. Why was there no, why did the international media leave the city days before the liberation? Why was there no media there at all to interview the tens of thousands who wanted to tell their story as they came out from that horrific experience? Why did the media not report the constant bombardment of the one and a half million civilians of West Aleppo for four years, costing thousands of innocent lives? And here we hear exactly the same stories from those who suffered the occupation of Aleppo, Homs, East Ghouta, Dei Azor. And meanwhile, of course, since the liberation of those areas, hundreds of thousands have returned and life is returning to areas of those cities where the jihadists have been defeated. There's also been deep hypocrisy in media reporting. For example, when reporting the obliteration of Mosul and Raqqa, the killing of tens of thousands of civilians by US and allied air raids on the cities was ignored, whilst the campaigns were heroically described as liberation from terrorists. Yet I believe that the numbers of civilians killed in the allied attack on Mosul exceeded those killed by the Syrian army's fight to liberate East Aleppo. We mustn't forget the civilians who are caught up in that. All war is brutal. Why are we constantly choosing the path of war rather than of peace? And why are we prolonging war by supporting extremists? What I witnessed in Aleppo and heard from the residents was an occupation by tens of thousands of militants showering death and destruction on the one and a half million inhabitants of the rest of the city for four years whilst holding hostage thousands of civilians in their midst, most of whom chose, when the opportunity came, to flee the battles. As the world shrieks offence at the bombing of jihadists in Aleppo, Homs, Dera, and Idlib, meanwhile we fund and arm the obliteration of Yemen by a state whose human rights record is perhaps the worst in the world, which is one of the greatest funders of terrorism and which we regard as one of our closest allies.
Is this not hypocrisy? As we judge Syria, we are condemned by our own actions. But judgment is not what we should be about. It is about asking the solutions, that, asking the questions that lead to solutions and looking for positives that can be encouraged and nurtured for the benefit of peace. In April and May, I spent, this last April I spent May, I spent a further three weeks in Syria, traveling independently, including east from Aleppo, south of Raqqa, to De Azor on the Euphrates, which was only liberated from ISIS in last November. I also visited East Ghouta just a week after its liberation, meeting internally displaced persons there, and was present in Damascus during the final battle to liberate the suburbs of Damascus from six years of terrorist occupation. Those of us who have repeatedly visited Damascus in recent years will be aware of the constant risk and cost to innocent life of the daily shelling and regular car bombs perpetrated by the so-called rebels that our government and media supports, have supported. But why was it never mentioned that in six years, 11,000 civilians died in the center of Damascus from random attacks by the jihadists that our government supports. Two and a half thousand of those were children, and 30,000 were injured, many of these with life-changing maiming injuries, especially among the young. How would the British government be reacting if Westminster and the West End was under daily attack for six years, and 11,000 people were killed in daily shelling for six years by militant jihadists who occupied an area of, say, South London, and holding civilians in that area and holding hostage, would we or our media be calling them moderate rebels? How would we be reacting? There are thousands of inconsistencies in the way this contact, contact, conflict has been reported. I'm also aware that there are many different narratives as well. And as a part of post-conflict rebuilding, there is surely going to be a need for some kind of truth and reconciliation process that allows the real stories of the war to be told. But there's another great injustice that is being done as regards Syria. And I speak here as a man of faith. I've witnessed on many occasions local faith leaders, Christian and Muslim, engaged in dialogue at a local level, working to achieve reconciliation and ceasefires on the ground and into fighting, and doing remarkable work amongst their people as well in humanitarian work. Some of these people acting with great courage have lost their lives in doing this work. These efforts are simply dismissed by both politicians and faith leaders in the international community because they are perceived to be associated with the government. Such political bigotry, and that's what I believe it is, political bigotry, which sidelines positive actions that make for peace in favor of supporting violence and extremism and bombing, I find abhorrent wherever those attitudes come from. There may be flaws in the context of bitter conflict in how certain processes are worked out from our point of view, which incidentally is not knowledgeable of the local context because very few people actually visit the ground and listen to the people themselves. But to dismiss sincere efforts at dialogue and negotiation that have achieved an end to fighting and have saved countless lives in literally dozens of towns and villages across Syria whilst instead advocating the sort of sport of militant jihadists and even of bombing is in my mind unconscionable. There is much that is good that is being done in Syria and we ought to be encouraging and nurturing that. You will never hear of the schools that are reopening, the medical work that is being done, the humanitarian work that is being done by faith communities, by NGOs on the ground, by Syrians and by the Syrian government as well. Far from criticizing efforts at reconciliation and dialogue, let us work with those who are engaged in this ministry to bring, exercise, to bring expertise and maximize the potential and process to achieve real peace and reconciliation. Last year, I asked the Minister of Reconciliation in Syria, whose, son, whose own son was murdered by militant groups, if he would welcome experts in the field of peace building and reconciliation with experience from other conflicts, such as Northern Ireland or Rwanda or the Balkans, and he said that such partnership would be welcomed with open arms. But instead, all we can do because of our political bigotry is to dismiss these efforts and support violence. <laughs>
In Syria, as I say, there is much good work being done on the ground within government-controlled territory, which is most of the country. Faith communities, charities, NGOs, government bodies are all working hard to serve the millions of internally displaced, the vast majority of whom have fled the brutality of areas under so-called rebel occupation to the comparative safety of government-controlled areas. And of course, conditions are difficult, and they will be until the economic situation is improved. And of course, there is corruption as well. Sadly, there is corruption in all states, and particularly in war economies. But I would dare to suggest that we have corruption on a massive scale in Britain too, but it is institutionalized and hidden within the very structure of our corporate systems. Sanctions too are causing a much more hardship. And as is always the case, innocent civilians, mostly the vulnerable, are dying because of the sanctions imposed by the international community. Sanctions, as mentioned by Peter, I think, do not hurt governments, they hurt the ordinary people. As a Christian doctor said to me last year, we are being killed twice by the terrorists that your government are supporting and by the sanctions that mean that we cannot get the medicines or the, government or the equipment to treat the people who are suffering because of the terrorism that you support. So I have a number of questions. Should the complexity of these matters mean that we should not address the policies that have helped create them? because our policies have helped create some of these issues. On the contrary, given the consistently, consistently catastrophic consequences of our interventions and policies, should we not be actively seeking alternative solutions? Remembering that it is for Syrians to decide their future, not for us or anybody else, but for Syrians to decide future, why are we not listening to the voices of the vast majority of Syrians inside Syria today? Why are we supporting militant jihadism? Why are we causing further suffering by imposing sanctions? Why are we not working with agencies inside Syria to support positive efforts at reconciliation, peace building, humanitarian assistance, and rebuilding of communities? Put aside that political bigotry. Let's work for humanitarian uh, reconstruction. Solutions to the complexity of the structures that we have created in the global order are difficult to find and implement, but in one sense, are they? Are the solutions difficult because our principles have become so terribly compromised and corrupted by selfish agendas? Perhaps whether it be addressing issues such as Syria or Palestine, Yemen or other urgent issues, we need to be reconsidering the principles by which we operate as an international community and considering the best interests of those countries rather than our own. Interesting that Peter mentioned the Silk Road project and the One Belt, One Road. It's very clear that the political and economic hegemony of the West is declining. And I've been very interested by this new development coming from the East. The contrast between the current policies of East and West are stark. On the one hand, the West attempts to, appears to attempt to assert its influence by, and control by bombing countries into submission and operating policies of regime change to install puppet regimes amenable to our own interests. By contrast, China has a Belt and Road Initiative which seeks to improve communications and infrastructures in numerous countries across Eurasia and Africa with the intention of bringing development and economic benefits for all whilst respecting the sovereignty of nations and social affairs within countries. The Chinese have described this as, quote, a new model of relations among nations. Now, whatever the challenges of this initiative, and notwithstanding the fact that there will, of course, always be geopolitical interests at play, I find this approach infinitely more appealing than the current policies of the West that seem dominated by militaristic, power-dominated, economically advantaged agendas. So in conclusion, I believe that we need to be re-examining our priorities. We need to be seeking paths for, that make for peace, real peace, rather than promoting policies and creating alliances that prolong conflict and sustain the hegemony of military, political, and economic domination according to our own interests. We need to be listening to the people of the countries with which we are engaged and assisting them to make their own choices that are beneficial for their own interests. We need to be assisting organizations and initiatives that are working for the rebuilding of society, rehabilitation and reconciliation. 
And respect for international law and sovereignty are, of course, essential, as are, of course, respect for the rights, the needs, and the aspirations of the other. We should seek not domination, but complementarity, inclusiveness, and connectivity that benefits all and protects the environment. In situations of conflict, our intervention, I believe, rather than being a military one, should be one that seeks to assist actions that are positively engaged in peace building and reconciliation and the humanitarian and economic well-being of ordinary citizens. Are not these the values that we would wish to promote? They're certainly not the values that the world sees us with. Believe me, when the world looks at Europe and America, as has been mentioned, <laughs> we've been, our, our, our reputation is very, very low on the list now. This needs from us a new approach of respect and concern for the other. Or rather, I would suggest, an approach that has been promoted for centuries in a number of religious traditions, but which has been overridden by modern political economies and structures and, of course, human greed. Perhaps the wisdom of the sages is worth recovering to remind us that we all live on one earth and live under one sky, apart we shall destroy it. Together, we can nurture it and try to help each other live peacefully within it. Thank you. Thank you there, Reverend Lashdown. That was a, a wonderful, sincere and impassioned speech. And it was in keeping with tonight's theme of what the title was for tonight's event, which was Towards a Lasting Peace. Many people may uh, accuse us and some of the speakers of being pro-war and things like that. Nothing could be further from the truth, as you've just heard, and that's totally in, in, in line with what we are about. I said at the start, we, all the speakers here are dr driven by a sincere and profound desire for an end of wars, wars of aggression. And, like. So we're going to take a, a break now for 10 minutes and we'll come back on and to conclude the, the night's events we'll start off with Eva Bartlett and then with Adam Gary to finish. So if we could all take 10 minutes now and we'll be back. Thank you. <laughs>